um, we have been going through this um, teaching and uh, <clears throat> our intention is for you to to get acquainted with the kingdom of God like I have said to us God did not give us a religion Jesus did not come to bring religion to us what is being practiced in most of the churches today is what is called religion religion can never help you Religion will help you to endure your circumstances, endure your problems. That's why you see the church is full of people that are full of problems, but the problems, they are just enduring it. People that are full of sicknesses, people that are full of poverty. So religion makes you, give you the grace to endure your problems. That's not what Jesus came for. Jesus came to give us power to be able to control our circumstances, to be able to rule our environment. That's why Jesus came. That's why he came preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So we started from the beginning to show you what is the mind of God from the beginning for man. We showed you how man lost that mandate of dominion. We showed you how Jesus came back to restore that dominion back to you and I. Then we told you that after Jesus had come to restore, he went back. Then the spirit of the kingdom had to descend, had to come on it. The spirit of the kingdom is the one that is on the earth today. Holy God, Holy Spirit. He is the one that is going to help us to be able to enjoy the benefits of this kingdom. Is going to be able to help us to be able to rule again in our environment, to be able to rule over circumstances, to be able to rule over demons, to be able to rule over poverty. No one is created to be poor. Poverty is a spirit that comes from the pit of hell. So the kingdom gives us power to control and to rule and dominate these things. So when the Holy Ghost came, like I shared with us, the first thing he had to do was to restore the language of heaven that we lost in the garden. That's why when, when they became God, when, when the Holy Ghost came on the door of Pentecost, the first thing they spoke was tongue. That was the restoration of the language of heaven. So last week we shared with you that now that you have learned to, the Holy Ghost have taught you now to speak the language of heaven. The King is also speaking to you. You need to also understand how to hear the king and understand the king. That's what we talked about last week. So today we are going to go further. Please go to page 12. Go to page 12 of your of the booklet in your mind. Page 12. So having now been able to understand how to hear the voice of the king. Let me tell you, children of God, in every kingdom, in every country, every country has what is called culture. The Zulus have their own culture. The Shonas have their own culture. The Igbos from Nigeria. Every nation has culture, how they behave, how they live. Also, in the kingdom of God, we also have our own culture. We have our own language. We have our own dress code. So as a kingdom of the city of heaven, you don't dress anyhow. So we have a culture. That's why the Zulus dress the way they dress. You see them, when you see them, they dress the way they dress. It's their culture. You look at the tossers. The way they dress is because of their culture. When you look at some of us coming from Nigeria, you see that there is a way we dress. You know, this one is from Nigeria. Say, wait, wait. The Indians, let's forget about this one. This is European. For the typical Indians, there is this way they dress. They have their sari and all those things. Every culture have their dress code. Have their, they, they have the, the way they live. So, when we, when we lost the kingdom, 
Satan took over the human humanity and began to teach us about his own culture, his own language. So that's why you see people are swearing, people are lying, because the Bible says a liar, Satan is the father of all lies. Is his culture, is his nature to lie. So when you see yourself lying, it's because you learned it from the kingdom you were coming from. When you see yourself swearing, it's because you learned it from the kingdom of Satan where you have been before. When you see a girl sleeping around with boys or boys sleeping around with girls, it's because that's what they learned from where they were coming from. In the kingdom of God, you need to change the way you have been living if you are going to enjoy in this kingdom. So I want us to look at the Bible first and foremost. Let's look at Romans 8 from verse 28 to 29. Romans 8 from verse 28 to 29. Are you there? Yeah. I read this says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Listen, let me tell you, every born again child of God has a purpose, has a, God has a plan for you. That's why he said, I know the plans I have for you. God has a plan for your life. You are not a mistake. You are not a biological mistake. Even, even if you don't know your father, you are still not a mistake. If you have, God has a purpose, has a plan for allowing you to come here. So God says, everything happening in your life is working to make sure to align you to that God's purpose. When he says everything, that's include the good things and the bad things that is happening around you. So everything happening around you as a child of God, not one of them, none of them is coincidence. None of them is coincidence. Everything is working to align you to God's purpose for your life. You are not on earth just to live, to exist. You are not here just to consume oxygen. No. God has a purpose for you. And everything working in your life. Look at Joseph. How who would have thought that everything that happened in Joseph was taking him to his destiny? Imagine putting him in the pit. Imagine after bringing him, they sold him into slavery. From into slavery, he would do, he put him in prison. Who would have thought that all these things were working out to bring him to his book, to God's plan for his life? So that's why everything happened. If you are truly a child of God and you are living like a child of God, everything happening. Is gonna work out for your good. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Let's look at verse 29. Verse 29 says, For whom he foreknew, he also did prestidenet to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. For whom he foreknew. So God knew you before you were even born. Remember the story in the book of Jer Jeremiah 1 verse 5. He said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I ordained you a prophet to the nations. For whom he foreknew, he also predestinated to be conformed. The word conform means to mold. The word conform means to, to behave according to the standard. So when we were unbelievers, we lost the image of God. Remember, in the book of Genesis, the Bible said, let us make man in our image. In the book of Genesis 1 to 6, let us make man in our image. So God created you originally to look like him. That was the plan of God. And I say to you here, that image, the word image, talks about nature. We have the nature of God. God created you to have his nature in you. So when Satan came and kidnapped us and hijacked the earth, he put his own image in us. So now that we have become born again, the next thing that God wants to do is to change that image again back to the image of God. That's why he said, look at verse 29 again. 
for whom he foreknew, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his dear son. So that you have to be remolded. You have to be changed from what you used to be before. Now back to the image of God. That was the initial plan of God for your life. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion. So for you to be able to rule in this kingdom, for you to be able to dominate in this kingdom, you must go back to the image of God. And that's one of the things Holy Ghost came to do. To remold us, to be conformed to the image of his dear son. And he says, Jesus is the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So we must look like him. We must think like him. We must behave like him. We must act like him. If we are going to rule like he ruled. You know Jesus was able to command the sea and the sea obeyed. Commanded the wind and the wind obeyed. He was able to command demons and they listened. He was able to do all kinds of miracles. That is the same thing that God wants for you and I. But for us to do it, we must be remolded again to the image of God. And that's one of the things the Holy Ghost came to do. Holy Spirit came to do this work in our life. So when we look at our, our booklet there, it says what the Holy Spirit does within us. What the spirit of the kingdom does in us. So remember, the Holy Spirit is in you. The Holy Spirit is upon you. Are you getting what I'm saying to you? The Holy Ghost is in you. And the Holy Ghost is upon you. So the Holy Spirit in you is there to work to make you, to mold you again, to look like God, to behave like God. The Holy Ghost upon you gives you power to rule over the earth. So those two, we're going to look at them differently. But today we're going to look at the Holy Ghost in us. So it's like I said there, His presence in us produces the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And His power upon us produces the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So the gift of the Holy Spirit is the power of God. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is the character of God, the nature of God. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is the power of God. The fruit of the Spirit is the character of God, the nature of God. We must have two of them to be able to rule. Otherwise, you will continue being ruled by circumstances. You will continue being ruled by demons. You will continue being ruled by poverty. Everything that you're supposed to do, we continue to do until the image of God is seen in you. Shout hallelujah. Amen. So let's look at our text there. Like uh, there is a scripture there, Galatians 5, 22 to 23. Then we have John 15, verse 5. So Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. I am the vine. You are, we are, those of you that came there, we are on page 12. If you don't, page 12 of our book, page 12. Jesus said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Talk to me, you are the branches. So, have you seen a tree before? Where does fruit come? Is it from the, the, the where? where? Where do you see fruits? On the branches. So we are the part of Christ that bears fruit. So people, when they come to Jesus for anything, it is you and I that are supposed to give them fruit. What do you do? You eat fruit, isn't it? Fruit satisfies, isn't it? Fruit brings, it makes your stomach to be full, satisfies you, you know. So we are the one that Jesus will use to satisfy people's thirst and hunger and pain. We are the one because we are the branch that bears fruit. Branch bears fruit. Are you getting me, child of God? So, as branches, we are the part of Jesus that bears fruit. As newborn believers, which the Holy Ghost is living in you, we are empowered to bear fruit. Empowered. Then now, let's look at that Bible version in the book of Galatians 5, 22 to 23. Let's get there and read it. 
22 to 23. I read, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. I'm reading from the King James Version. I read from the King James Version. The fruit of the Spirit is I want you to look at me. Look at that scripture again, then you look at me. What did he say? Did he say the fruits? Or did he say the fruit? The fruit. Sorry? The so it means it is singular. Yes. It's not plural. But like when he mentioned them, when you look at them, can't you see plurality of words? It's not only one word. This fruit is not only one word. There are many of them. So why do you think the Bible chose to use a singular word to describe joy, peace, all of it? Why do you think the Bible used one, you know, singular? Instead of saying the fruits, this is what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be the fruits. He said the fruit. Have you thought about it? Do you know why God did that? You know why? The reason is because first, the Bible says in the book of 1 John 4 verse 8 He said, for God is what? Love. How many God do we have? For God is love. So what the Bible means here is this. Some of you say, I don't have patience. I've heard it from many Christians. I don't have patience for anybody. You know why? You are lying. You are lying. If you don't have patience, it means you are not born again. But I've had many Christians say, I don't have, I am not gentle. That's how I am born. You are lying. You know why he chose to say the fruit is because if you have one, you must have all. Because when the Holy Ghost came into you, he did not come in pieces. Okay, today he, he enters the you know, tomorrow is done. Uh -uh. He came full. You are full of the Holy Spirit. So you have all these things in you. It's just that you have not allowed the Holy Ghost to bring them out from you. That's what is happening. I don't have patience for anybody. You are lying. It's just that you yourself is the problem. You have patience in you. You just need to work it out. Have you heard where the Bible said in Philippians 2, verse 12, 2, 12 and 13? He said you must work out your salvation. You must work it out. That thing that is in you, you must bring it out for people to see. Are you with me? Are you, are you still with me? So here, yeah, let's go back to our, our booklet. He says, a fruit is, some, is not something you possess as soon as you become a born again. So when you become a born again, immediately, now nah, everything starts manifesting. No, it's not, it doesn't work like that. How many of you have planted a fruit, a seed tomorrow, yesterday and today you have harvested it? Have you seen it before? And he didn't say you have vegetable. Vegetable you planted today, after two months or three months you have harvested, isn't it? And it dies immediately as well. But a fruit, a fruit, a tree grows every year. It keeps on bearing fruit. Every year it keeps on bearing. But one, it takes time to grow to start bearing fruit. So that's why when you become born again, that's when the journey has started. The journey begins the day you become born again, because now you are, and you should allow the Holy Ghost now to begin to remold you, to bring you back to the image you lost initially. Until demons see the image of God in you, they will not obey you. That's why when you say, come out, they say, who are you to tell me to come out? You have, you have my image, and you're telling me to come out. That's why they slap the children seven sons of scale and beat them mercilessly and tore their clothes, and they run away naked. Seven pastors ran away naked. 
with bruises all over from one demon. Because why? They have the image of Satan and they want to command Satan to come out. You are lying. You want to cast them out. They're going to break your tongue. You have bitterness and you want to say, Satan, get leave me. It's not leaving you. Sorry. Just endure it. You have unforgiveness and you want to say, Satan, get up. It's not going anywhere. You have my image. I have right to stay in your life. I have right to comment you. So Jesus needs to bring us back to the image of God for us to begin to rule again. So, let's go back to our, our book where he said, so when, when we talk about this thing, you have to want, first and foremost, plant the seed. And the Bible told us in the book of First Peter, 1 23. He said you were born again, not by incorruptible seed, but by in, not by corruptible seed, but by incorruptible seed by the word of God. So when you became a born again was when the seed was planted in you. Your heart is the soil. Remember the parable of the sower in the book of Mark 4. He said the sower went out to sow. When Jesus explained that, he says, Your heart is the soil. So that's why the Bible said to us in the book of Proverbs 1 23. He said, Guard your heart with all diligence. Look, let me ask you if you have a farm and you plant seedlings in that farm, do you just leave it open like that? What do you do? You protect your farm. If you don't protect it, bears will come, animals will come, and they will eat it. That's what most of you do when you leave your heart open and things are going in, anything, thoughts are coming and you are, that's what you do. Because those thoughts is coming to destroy what has been sowed in your heart. So your heart is the soil. So the day you became a, a born again was the day that seed was sown. That's why Peter said you became a born by an incorruptible seed of the word of God. So that's when the seed was planted. So when a seed is planted in a garden, it must be, the, the first and foremost, the ground must be prepared. How many of you have gone to plant and you just go and take your seed and throw it in there? What do you do first? You have to remove the, clear the, clear the land first. Prepare the land, prepare the ground. Then when it is prepared, then you sow the seed. When you sow the seed, do you just leave it like that? No. When you sow the seed, then you, they, 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 then you begin to, you, you, you start to water it, isn't it? You still water that seed. You also need to weed because from time to time you can you see things coming up. So that's why whenever any thought, that evil thought comes to you, you must get it out of your life immediately. That's weeding, removing those things. Because if you don't do, it's going to choke the seed that has been planted in your heart. So that's why you don't just sit down one place and you're thinking about that boy. Oh, look at his person. I love it. Maybe I can touch it. Oh, you just sit in there and you are smiling. People think you are crazy. You are just fantasizing. Oh, my son. Oh, my God. And you are just sitting there thinking. You know what you are doing? You have allowed the weed to come to take the seed that is planted in you. You are just sitting there thinking that you are stupid. And I am stupid. I am not good for anything. I am useless. As you are sitting there, you have allowed the, 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 the weed to come to choke the seed that has been planted in you. You are just sitting there thinking about what people have told you in your office that you are, your nose, you, you, you look like your father. Your nose is a vision. And it's giving you trouble all the whole day and more than week. You are thinking about it. You don't know what you have done. You have allowed the devil to send something to come and approach that seed. So that's why I said you must guard your heart. Guard it with all diligence. Let me ask you, have you gone to where the bank before or maybe where there is treasure? Where you see this place there is treasure? Do you know the kind of security there? Because there is treasure there. It's heavy security guard. That's what you must do to your heart. Because your life is in your heart. Whoever that controls your heart controls your life. So if you want to know who you are, check, the, check on the things you think every day. That's how you know where you are, who you are. Check what, just check, not when you are with people. When you are alone, check those things you think. That is a sign of what is ruling your life. If those thoughts are from the devil, you are already in his pocket. If those thoughts are God, you know that God is the one who lives in your life. So you have to remove the weed. You have to bring 
protection. You protect it from parasites. That's serious. So you protect it from parasites. You trim it. When you see it's growing, you need to trim it. Cut it. So that when the fruit begins to come, it bears nice fruit. You trim it. That's why the Bible said, I am divine. My father is the gardener. He said, My father prunes every, every branch, every branch. He said, My father prunes, cut it off. You, there are things you need to remove to make sure that when the seed starts coming, the seed is not going to be a seed that is sick, but a nice seed. A nice fruit. So these are the things you do, and you prune. And finally, when it is time for harvest, You'll be able to harvest nice fruit. So it, it takes process. Christianity is not for lazy people. You must work hard. It's your life. You cannot just be sitting there in attending everything set and throws to you. No. Christianity is not for lazy people. That's why today we have been taught so much. God will do it. God will do it. I'm waiting on God. Look at you. My brother, you're going to wait forever. You are waiting on God. God is waiting on you. You are still waiting on Him. <laughs> That's the language of lazy people. Language of religion. God is waiting on you to go and change nations. God is waiting on you to go and disciple nations. You are still waiting on God. Oh my God. That's what we have been taught. That's what we have been told. And for 10 years you still been waiting. Praying. Waiting. <laughs> Sorry, stop waiting to start doing something now. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Let's look at Luke 13, 6 to 9. Luke 13, 6 to 9. Are you there? Let me, I, I read really the says. He spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of the vine, vineyard, Behold, these three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and found none. Cut it down. <laughs> 